All right, everyone, welcome to Strictly Sports. I'm Jacob Brown. Today we're going to do our 2020 National League preview for the playoffs. Join with Stephen Cashin here. We're going to go over the entire National League. We've already done individual podcasts for each team in the NL, literally every single team. So we have 15 podcasts out right now on all of our, on all of our platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. They're all on there. You can take a look at them. But here we're going to take a deeper dive into the league in total, who we think is going to make the playoffs, win each division, who are the wild cards, who's on the outside looking in, and that's what this is for. And I will say to start this, uh, my opinion has changed as we've kept going throughout these podcasts. You know, originally I had the Mets winning the NL East. I've changed that. I, I originally had the National League Central in a different order. Um, so this is certainly this exercise has really changed my opinion on the National League, and I hope it does the same with the American League. But, Stephen, I mean, what about you, man? You've been, we've been doing these, all 15 of them. Uh, how have you been throughout this whole experience with the NL? Uh, it's been up and down. It's been a roller coaster of emotions almost with looking at these teams because, you know, you look at it with a grain of salt to start off with, and then you dive into the stats, and then you start shuffling it around 20 different times. I think I've had four different winners of the Central Division just because how tightly it's compacted. Yeah. I mean, the only clear. The only obvious pick is, is the Dodgers so far. They're their most complete team, like we hashed over in their podcast. But there's just so many avenues you can go with this NL side. I mean, it's crazy how talented all these teams are. Teams that you don't think are going to be there are getting better. Their prospects are, are just accelerating through their farm system. It, it's going to be a fun one to look at, look at, and I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of dicing it up here. Oh, yeah, and then we will be doing the same thing for the American League, guys, the next 16 days. We're going to start with the AL West, go to the AL Central, finish up with the AL East, and then we'll do, excuse me, we'll do an American League playoff pod as well. So that'll be in about 16 days. And then also what we're going to do, we're going to do two separate Yankee pods, uh, one with me and Steven, and then one with me and my dad and my brother, because they've wanted to be on one of my podcasts for a while. And uh, I think it would be really fun if us three could do that. But uh, that's how we'll do that in the future. Um, but let's get started with this podcast and talk about the National League East to begin. So really, you know, since we've already had these individual podcasts, we're just going to go over who we think are going to be playoff contenders. It's going to be a three horse race. You could say the Phillies are on the outside looking in, you know, they might be there. I just think too much has to happen for the Phillies. Uh, they're just not even close to these other three teams. It's going to be, be between the defending World Series champion Washington Nationals the Atlanta Braves, and the New York Mets. And the Braves won the division last year. So I look at this division. They're so tight. You can go lineup, rotation, bullpen. You can rank them all you want. To me right now, and I've changed my opinion based on the NL East pods, uh, I actually now have the Nats winning the NL East. I think they're a really complete team. Uh, I reordered their lineup to make it look a lot better. Um, and, and I reordered it, put some guys in different positions. Uh, I really looked at their rotation, and it's much better than I even thought. I mean, Anibal Sanchez, Austin Voth could be pretty good four or five starters, and their bullpen's deeper than I thought, too. So uh, I would say Nationals one, Mets two, Braves three, and we'll keep diving into them here. And how are you going to order it? Right now I have uh... – God, I, I diced it up three different ways and originally i had the cardinals winning um the division or no no, no. That's, we're in that's the, changed uh, now. I have, we're in the uh nl east yeah nl oh nl east my bad that's that's my fault no you're good um in the east side, i've got then I, I gotta go with the defending you know champions i gotta i gotta go back with them just because how deep that pitching staff is we alluded to it you have strasburg um uh, you have strasburg scherzer um corbin on the third hole there, it's just a good one, two, three punch. And then you've added some guys, you have, you have Estrubo Cabrera, Howie Kendrick. Yeah, a ton of guys coming back. Yeah, you lost Rendon. But I've got them in the one spot right there. Closely right behind them trailing, I have the Mets, and then I have the Braves. I think the Mets, are, talent-wise, are a little bit better than the Braves. The pitching staff on the Braves side isn't quite there for me to put them into the playoffs. But, you know, you can't count them out. Still have Albies uh, in a one hole, their ace. So it's going to be a really, it's going to be a really race going down the stretch. I think the whole season, it, people are going to be really surprised with this uh, this division. But I got Nats one, Mets two, Braves in the third hole. But it's going to be very close. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, and the way that I changed this Nationals lineup, so a lot of a lot of the sites had as Drupal Cabrera or Starlin Castro starting at second base, and I looked at it and I'm like, wait a second, uh, Howie Kendrick last year hit 344 with a 400 WOBA and a 146 weighted strong created plus, which are well above league average. I mean, a 400 WOBA is crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, just to put it into perspective, Juan Soto's, and, and I know Kendrick played a lot less games, but Juan Soto's WOBA was 394. So it just tells you how valuable Kendrick was last year. You can't stuff that guy on the bench. And then I factored in Carter Keyboom here, who he might, low-key, he might be their next Rendon. If you look at his minor league stats, he's there with the power and the production at the minor league level. If he can come up to the bigs and even be close to what Rendon was, suddenly you have some good bats. And if you really dive into the stats here, it says that Trey Turner and Eric Thames, new addition Eric Thames, are around the same in value because Trey Turner's WOBA is 356, Eric Thames' WOBA is 354, and their weighted run created plus are both exactly the same at 117. So I underrated that Eric Thames acquisition. I underrated Key Boom, and I kind of, you know, I forgot that Kendrick should really be in the starting lineup. If you actually look at that lineup, Stephen, it's pretty good. Yeah, that's why I was kind of like I was giving them, you know, I was giving them props because I like the Thames addition. You know, we were going back and forth there, like, well, is that how how valuable would that be? But I liked his numbers in, in spring training. He was kind of lighting it up. A guy that was showing a lot of promise for this this upcoming season, and I like his approach to the plate. You know, his wedge runs created plus, like you said, the the value there. You know, yeah, key boom too. Like it's just this lineup very. You know, it's quietly slept on just because the fact that they lost Rendon and people think that's such a huge factor. Yes, it is great player, but you know you're not going to be missing a whole lot from that production if you got guys stepping up and producing, you know, the same as they did last year. And I, I like the additions they made. So this team can really make a deep run again. And with that pitching staff, like you said, they don't have to do a whole lot on the offensive side to try to get them back to where they want to be this year. Yeah, exactly. And and let's just say you know Howie Kendrick takes a step back. Well, you still have this Drupal Cabrera and you still have Starlin Castro to fill in. I mean, those guys were both league average players last year. So either way, you have three options at second base. And if Key Boom doesn't work at third, you could always put Cabrera over there as well. So they have tons of flexibility. You know, Kurt Suzuki is even underrated a little bit. Had 17 homers in 85 games. So where did that come from? I mean, who knows? But Suzuki just won a championship. He was their guy behind the plate, a little bit underrated as well. Uh, one thing I want to give uh, approach to you with, Stephen, is this is something that shocked me last night. You look at Juan Soto and Ronald Acuna Jr., and we had this argument back in on those pods. Juan Soto has a 394 WOBA and a 142 weighted run created plus. If you look at um, Ronald Acuna Jr., Ronald Acuna has a 369 WOBA and a 126 weighted run created plus. So based on those two value stats – Juan Soto was light years ahead of Ronald Acuna. How do you view that? I, I was shocked. Yeah, that's 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 a very interesting stat because you look at the the general numbers between the two together. You look at walks, RBIs, home runs, and they're identical. And then you go into the advanced sabermetrics and stuff like that. You know, the Woba really stands out, and way to runs created plus to me is very valuable. It shows you how what's your production in that lineup to a deeper level, like we've talked about these stats. And like I said, Juan Soto is, I think you said, his approach to the plate kind of shows you how far ahead he is in, in the development process over Acuna, just because of the fact that he stays patient, he's, he's very disciplined at the plate and he waits for his pitches. He doesn't dive in and, and try to get way ahead of himself. You look at Acuna and he's kind of, he's set on one pitch. He's getting out front, swinging at bad pitches, getting himself in bad counts. Yes, the talent takes over there, but Juan Soto, you see that in the way to run created plus stat. He's doing the right things, getting runners in when he needs it to. He's creating a ton of offense, gets on base, does everything you need him to do in the three hole and keep that lineup moving. So I could definitely see that. That's that's very intriguing to me. I think Soto is a better player than Acuna as of right now. Two great players. I give him the edge and the stats don't lie. Yeah. I think, you know, like you said, the thing that separates it is that, you know, Acuna swings at too many pitches. He has a 26% strikeout rate, which is way too high for a, for a player of his caliber. And listen, I love Ronald. 
Buckner. I think he's a top young player in this game, top 15 at the very least in baseball. It's just, you know, you look at him and Soto, everyone thinks it's a lot closer and Acuna kind of has that, that star factor that, you know, you notice him more because he hits farther home runs and he's more pizzazz. But Juan Soto is low-key the better player here. But if you take a look at this Atlanta Braves lineup, there's a lot of ways you could do it. And I kind of retooled the lineup in my way as well. So the way I looked at it, most places had Ender and Ciarte as the starting center fielder with Acuna and Wright. Uh, I look at that and I say, well, in Ciarte, you know, offensively, he's just not there. Nick Markakis was. So I have Nick Markakis leading off and playing right field and Acuna playing center field. He has shown in the past, Acuna has, that he can play center field and he can be fine there. So you have Markakis and Wright leading off. Then I have Acuna in the two hole, Freeman in the three hole, Albies four, Ozuna five. The only reason I did it that way was because if you keep Acuna in the leadoff spot and you hit Albies second, then who's your five hitter, right? I mean, because then are you going to hit Markakis fifth? So I felt like Markakis is, is much better off in a leadoff type of position. You could put Ozuna in that five hole and just extend that lineup one more position down. You know, what do you think of this Braves lineup, Stephen? Yeah, it's it's in, it's interesting because you can you can tool it around different ways. Like I had Enciarte in the eighth spot, Acuna batting leadoff just to get him more at bats, but you can you can protect him and move him down and kind of give yourself an opportunity down to the sixth spot to have production. Because right now I had Travis Darno in the five hole, and I don't think you really want him sitting there right now. Right. Just because that lineup to keep moving one through six, and you can move Darno to the sixth spot. But like I said, Mark Akis, batting two eighty five last year, nine homers, 62 RBIs. His slugging was four twenty on base was over three fifty. A guy who's been in the league way longer than Enciarte has. I think he's proven a lot more things to be an everyday starter. He knows the ins and outs. He's very he has a, another good approach at the at the at the plate. His fielding's also very good. I like him over in right field. That way you can move Acuna over to center field. His glove in center field is, is phenomenal. I look at this lineup and then you have Dansby Swanson, bat at two fifty last year. You know, he could you know, he's going to be one of your tool guys to like kind of still – he's still developing, still figuring out the league. So he could be your seven or eight guy too if you wanted to go that route. But one through four, it's pretty solid. Acuna, Albies, Ozuna, Freddie Freeman. Knock it down to the five spot, put Marquecas there maybe. And then you have Darnell in the sixth spot. So then you have seven, eight is your weakest part of your lineup, but you're not in bad shape. Yeah, it's, it's not like this lineup's bad by any stretch. It's just it's the three main guys – Acuna, Albies, and Freeman, and, and everyone else, because Ozuna's a little bit overrated, in my opinion. Uh, you know, only a 109 weighted drum created plus. That's really not that great for a guy that had 29 bombs. So he's good. He's just not, he's not anywhere close to Josh Donaldson. I think we really have to recognize here what a loss that was for them. And then you look at that rotation. It's just, it's not really there for me. I, I like Mike Soroka, but if you really dive into the stats and look in deeper, him and Max Freed are actually much closer than you would think. Their FIPs are pretty close. Uh, Mike Soroka's FIP is 345. Max Freed's was 3.72. And actually, Max Freed strikes out two more batters per nine than Mike Soroka. So that could turn into a nice little one two uh, combo there in the rotation. And then you have Hamels, Fultonevich, Newcomb, who they're going to say, you know, guys, just try and be, you know, in the middle of where you've always been in your careers and, and we'll try and roll it out here for 162. But if you look at that rotation, Stephen, it's a little weaker than than, than uh, Washington's and the Mets. Yeah, that's where I have the that's the difference maker for me. It's, it changes the whole dynamic of the of the playoff race. You look at the one two punch that the, the Braves have, Soraka and and uh, and Pride, and, and so they 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 won about thirty games combined last year. ERAs right around Soraka was a two six, Pride was around a four oh two. Yeah, it's not that. That's going to be your one, two guys for sure. But then going off that, you have Nuncom, you have Sean Nuncom. Um, who was their number two? Who was the other guy you uh, said? Uh, Mike, Fultonevich. Uh, yes, he was eight and six last year with the four two seven ERA. I mean, so you can piece it together after this after number two, but you're, there's still question marks of who's going to be your fourth and fifth guy for sure. Like your solid fourth guy, and then your fifth guy. So. You know, there's some question marks in that in that rotation. 
bullpen, we 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 kind of touched on that too. There's some pieces that need to get figured out over there in the back end. It, it actually, bullpen. yeah. It, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, it is actually a little better than I thought too. Though, you look at Melanson, uh, Shane Green, Will Smith, Luke Jackson, Chris Martin, Darren O'Day. All of those guys strike ten or more out per nine, except for Melanson, who strikes out nine per nine. So those dudes really, they, they, their strength is that they strike you out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I like the uh, O'Day in the back end of the bullpen up there. He's been the guy who's been very consistent over the years. And, and yeah, you can, you can, you can, you know, this team is not, I'm not riding them off by any stretch. I just think what hurts them is their starting rotation. I think that to me, if you can't get guys that are going to get you a quality outing every fifth day, no, you don't have to have a perfect outing every single you know, time you're out on the mound. But, you know, you can't go out there and blow up, you know, once every three starts. It's just not going to work out. So I think if they can get the rotation in place and, and find some consistency, some, you know, some solid four or five guy, then you can compete. But right now, that's why I have them in. Third yeah, I, I agree with you. It's I, just that it's that separation. Their lineup isn't as good yeah. as the other two. <laughs> Their rotation isn't as good as the other two, and their bullpen is probably even with the other two in the division. So that you know, when you're splitting hairs, that's just what you got to do. So when looking at the Mets here, and this is another lineup that I retooled uh, last night when I was going over this. There's a lot of different ways that you could do it, but this is how I did it. I have Brandon Nimmo leading off and playing center field. Uh, this is a dude who's actually underrated, even though he hit 221 last year. His WOBA was 340, and the year before that. His Woba was 385 with a 148 weighted drunk created plus. So I'm willing to give Nimmo another shot. I have McNeil in the two hole playing second base. Then I have Pete Alonzo hitting third playing first. You look at these stats too. Uh, Jeff McNeil and Pete Alonzo had the same exact Woba and same exact weighted drunk created plus at 384 and 143, uh, which is really crazy to think about that Alonzo is 53 home runs were just as valuable as Jeff McNeil's 23. Um, but that's how these stats break it down. Then you have Conforto cleaning up and playing right field. I have J.D. Davis batting fifth and playing third base. Then this is where it gets interesting for me. I actually have Dominic Smith starting in left field and hitting sixth because I looked at it and I said, why would you play Robinson Cano, who's older and under league average, when you could play Smith in left field and maybe move McNeil or Davis into the infield because Smith had a really good Woba at 368, and he's younger, and he's always been a prospect. So I figured, why not get Smith into that lineup? And then you have Wilson Ramos and Ahmed Rosario. So all eight hitters in that lineup are league average or better. Uh, that's a really talented lineup, in my opinion, Stephen. Yeah, for sure. You hit around the head with, with Smith playing over there at a second base. And, I mean, a guy who's a prospect, who's been a prospect for a while, Give him some big league time. Start start the clock now. Why don't you get the reps right away? If if it doesn't, I've said this about you know guys that are on the bubble of getting called up or getting full time reps. You have a guy behind you, Robinson Cano. If that is the route you want to go, the guy who's proven he can do it. So if things go sideways, you can plop him right back in and hey, there you go. There's your job. We'll give him some more work. But looking at this lineup, you got Jeff McNeil batting three eighteen last year. Pete Alonso. Just the production was off the charts there. 53 homers, 120 RBIs. You got Conforto, J.D. Davis, another 300 hitter. And then you look at seven and eight. You got Ahmed Rosario and Brendan Nimmo. I mean, both, you know, league average guys looking at stats, but guys who put together quality at bats and they get on base and they're, they're just, they're really role players on that team. And, and Wilson Ramos behind the dish, too, makes great. He throws runners out. And I like his approach to play. He hits the ball hard. Production's there. A guy who you don't see, you don't see many catchers producing nowadays. And he's one of them, one of the top five catchers in the league. In my Definitely. Opinion. But, you know, one through eight, they, they have a pretty, pretty solid lineup that can give. I mean, this could be a first place team too, first place team too. But I just give the edge to the Nats. But this team it, it's going to be right there. This, it's just going to be a tight race and it's, it's going to be very oh, fun to Oh, it's so watch. close. I mean, because the lineup is definitely advantage Mets. Rotation, though, you got to go Washington because, you know, Strasburg and Scherzer are, and Corbin are better than DeGrom, Stroman, and Mats. Even though DeGrom's the best pitcher in baseball, him or Garrett Cole, 
you know, Marcus Stroman, he's not as good as Strasburg or Scherzer or, or Corbin, and neither is Steven Matz. So, and this is where I may have overrated the Mets, which is why I don't have them winning the division anymore. Steven Matz was almost kicked out of this rotation with the additions of Porcello and Waka, and now he's still in there at a 4.21 ERA uh, with a 4.60 FIP. And then you have Porcello, who's really struggled the last two seasons. I do think he could be a bounce-back guy. Remember, he's won a Cy Young, and he just complained about how he was used in Boston, about what pitches they wanted him to throw. He was like, I just like throwing fastballs, and they wanted me to throw other stuff. So maybe he's a potential bounce-back candidate. Same thing with Michael Waka. In 2018, he had a 3.23 ERA with St. Louis, really struggled last year with a 4.76 ERA. But as a number five starter, nice flyer, bounce back candidate. But again, willing to take the proven Washington rotation over the Mets. And then you look at this Mets bullpen. We kept raving about it in that podcast. But at the end of the day, Jarese Familia really struggled last year, 5.70 ERA. Edwin Diaz was terrible. Uh, with a 5.59 ERA, still struck out 15 per nine, but the home runs were way too high at 2.3 per nine. That's terrible. And then Dellen Betances threw one inning all year. So we keep talking about this amazing 7.89 punch for the Mets, and they were terrible last year, or they weren't healthy. So how do you look at this Mets pitching staff, Stephen? Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, question marks there's a lot of uncertainty there that's the word i was looking for you know we're going starting with the starting lineup you know Porcello, like you said has potential to have that bounce back um you know giddy up behind his his stuff he you know he said he didn't want to throw what boston wanted them you know you get a certain pitching coach that says hey you're doing this we're doing it our way and you're not going to deviate from it that to me as a pitcher it, it messes with your with your mentality your approach to getting guys out you know, throw the fastball, throw what you can get guys, get by guys. And, you know, that could be a, a game changer for him. And we'll see how that works out for him in, in New York. But then you look at, you know, Matt's, you know, he's a, a very pedestrian 500 pitcher right. last year, you know, 11 or two ERA strikeouts were there. Innings pitched were there. He threw a lot, 160 innings pitched, but I mean, it's just not, he's not winning a whole lot of games. You're, you're winning one, you're losing one. So you're not getting any, any, getting any groove there. And then jumping into the bullpen, Familia and Diaz were – there was a stretch through, I think, 20 games there where they were just trying to find who is going to be our free yeah, right. <laughs> They figured it out. They, no one – you know, Diaz was blowing a save and Familia was blowing a save. I mean, they were three-run games there. And we talked about it in the podcast. They blew, I think it was about almost – I think it was roughly 20 games where they had lost because yeah. of the bullpen and the back end – you know, to close games, you know, either blowing it in the ninth inning, then going to extras and losing, but still game, critical games that they could have won and got them into the playoffs. And then I look at Batances, like you just said, pitched one inning and and blew out. Uh, was it Achilles, yeah. right? That he that he uh, the Achilles injury that just kept you know nagging him all year. Wasn't able to pitch, so taking a whole year off as a pro baseball player is huge. Your your stuff is not going to be as sharp. Your game time reps haven't been there for over a calendar year. So, yeah, on paper, if it all works out, yeah, great. Then this will be one of the best bullpens in the league. Could be the one of the best bullpens. But until we there's proof of that, then you just don't know. And Noah Syndergaard's out for the whole year. So there's that hurts. Too. Yeah, I mean, like if Syndergaard were here uh, and we kind of belittled that 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 loss in the, in the Mets pod, it really is huge because if Syndergaard were here – I probably would have the Mets still winning the division. It's just, you know, because that gives you three starting pitchers. But now you have two starting pitchers. You don't even know if you have a third. You have a seven, eight, nine without any confirmed seven, eight, nine efficient guys. Uh, it's just, again, the potential is there. If they all pan out and they're the guys that they were in 2018, it could be the best bullpen in baseball. But we haven't seen it in a year. We need to see it again. Another thing that concerns me about, you know, you brought it up with Betances not pitching last year. There's also going to be a longer hiatus now with this coronavirus delay. And for a reliever, it's a lot tougher to come back and kind of crisp that control because Betances, you know, while he strikes out a lot, he struck out 15.53 per nine uh, in his last season in New York. He actually walks a lot of people at three and a half per nine. 
So control's an issue for Bertances. He's going to need to come back and be crisp. Yeah, control has always been an issue for him. And, uh, you know, we saw it in glimpses of, of his Yankee career where he was just lighting it up. And he felt once he finds once he finds his mark, he's going and he's off to the races. And you know, once he's in the game, no one can touch him. And it's just a, it's a dangerous combination on the backside of the bullpen for, for teams. But, you know, having that control issue and not finding, you know, your, your mark and having a whole year and plus – off going into this year you just don't know and off an injury that's so fragile too that Achilles it's it's all mental too like you don't know you know when's the next time I I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna land wrong and it, it's gonna blow out again so mentally in the back of your head you're you're worrying so much about the injury not happening again and not focusing on your your command and your and how sharp your stuff is that can be an issue not pitching for over a year it's just critical I just don't know if he'll be the same guy that we saw in New York for a couple of years there where he was just so dominant. But, you know, I wish him the best. I hope he comes back and, and, and produces the way he was because he was getting to be one of the best relievers in the game in that time. And unfortunately he could never come back and, and stay healthy. But, you know, if he's healthy and going, he'll be one of the best guys in that bullpen. In that oh yeah, for sure. And I'm rooting for him too. I mean, you know, he was with the Yankees for seven, eight years, was dominant. And uh, I watched him actually tear his Achilles. I was watching that game against Toronto, and uh, it was pretty depressing. I mean, we, you know, the Yankees thought they were getting him back for the playoffs, and he thought he was coming back just in time for the playoffs, and then he blew out that Achilles. So it was uh, pretty depressing. But, again, he got his contract with the Mets. I'm happy for him, and I hope he pans out there. So, moving, so again, both Stephen and I have the same rankings for the NL East. This is where we differ, though. In the NL Central, I think you had the Cardinals winning the division. Am I right? Yeah, I was originally when I had him. I have it all shipped. Oh, now. okay, okay. So he's changed. I, I still have the Reds, and then Steven's got the Cardinals in third. So the way I have it, I have Cincinnati winning the division, the Cubs in second, Cardinals in third, Brewers in fourth. What about you, Steven? Well, this might be a shock to some, but I got the Cubs winning the oh. division, then I've got the Reds, then I got the Cardinals in third, and the Brewers. The Cubs are winning in the division because of the sole factor. I think they have too many weapons on this team that have been quiet for the last couple of years, and everyone's kind of slowly riding them off. And I think there's just too much superstar potential on this team to not produce this year. And it's a contract year for a lot of them, and I think that could be a good combination with you know performing, trying to win, keep this team intact for one, two more years. And then I dove into the Reds team, and we talked about it. MLB had them. I think it was the number three rotation in the league. So we, you know, diamond in the rough there for that we talked about with, with their combination of one, two, three guys, Bauer, Castillo, and Sonny Gray. That's a good – that's a great rotation. And then you add some of the pieces in that, uh, in that lineup with Moustakis and all them. You know, they could, be, they could be contenders. And then the cards, I think they're just too old. It's going to wear on them this year. The offense, to me, that wins you games, too. It win, I mean, if you can't score runs, I don't care how good your pitching is. Like, It's just, to me, they're, they just don't have that combination that's going to get them back to winning 90 games again. So that's where I had the knock on them. But I have Cubs, Reds, Cards, my top three. Yeah, I agree. And, and then we both have the Brewers on the outside just because they can rake. I mean, don't get us wrong, but their, their starting rotation is pretty terrible. They don't have a number one. And quite frankly, they don't really have a number two either. So Milwaukee's definitely lacking in the starting pitching area, and that's why we both have them in fourth. But I guess we could have a little debate here. So I have the Reds because I like their lineup. I think, listen, you look at the Cubs, obviously. Bryant, Rizzo, Baez, Schwarber, Contreras, those five are better than the five best players on the Reds. There's no denying that. I mean, that that's just a fact. But you look at this Reds lineup nonetheless – Suarez, really good. Moustakis, Castellanos, pretty good. Jesse Winker, really underrated. He's pretty good, too. Akiyama, if he comes in from Japan and he's the same guy, really above-average player. You have Aquino on the bench. Senzel is a potential young kid. So I think the totality of the Cincinnati offense, while it might not be as star-studded as the Cubs is, I think that the total lineup could be just as good. And then you look at the rotation – 
it's not even close. I mean, Cincinnati is a way better rotation than the Cubs. And then the bullpen, the Cubs don't have one effective reliever, whereas the Reds have four or five. So I look at it and I say lineups are the same, rotation Cincinnati, bullpen Cincinnati. Why do you have the Cubs winning the division, Stephen? I just think they're I think they're you know, their lineup one through eight can really score they can produce, you know, a lot of runs. And I think, you know, they're gonna have to just piece together the pitching staff and that on that side. And I think you Darvish, I mean, he's proven he's got he can bounce back and he, he had a great second half of the year. His strikeouts per nine were there, walks were down, only two point eight walks per nine. You know. And then you have Kyle Hendricks who I think could be the number one starter with his walks being below a one five per nine. And then John Lester's been a jury. He's been in the league forever. And I think he'll, you know, he'll be consistent enough to keep this ship afloat. And then you have Quintana and then you have Chatwood four and five, your fifth starter, you know, you can cycle them in and out, but Quintana at four, I think one through four, they're solid enough to, you know, complement with the, with the one through nine or one through eight lineup that they have. Question mark for me would be the bullpen. Um, you know, it's it's it is what it is. Kimbrel had a, a you know, kind of a he had not a good year in his standards. And you look at guys, other guys like Mills. I mean, you know, Roman Wick. I mean, there's some question marks there, but I think they'll piece it together enough where they can win enough games to win. Because like last year, they only they won 85 games. 84, yeah. 84 games. So you're not far. You weren't far off the mark from first place. The Cardinals won 91 to win the division. And the Cubs were – they lost a lot of close games as well, along with the Mets being, you know, your bullpen blew you some games. So you you win half those and you're right back in the mix. So I just can't ride this team off based on the fact that they're, they're hitting – can go off the charts and really be there for them. Yeah, I think just with you and me, the, the difference is – so, you know, again, we're picking hairs here. I, I mean, you know, this is a two-game difference you're talking about between these two teams – And, you know, I would just have the Reds as slightly better. One thing I will say to support your side, I mean, the Cubs were 500 or they were under 500 on the road. And that won't happen again. They they, they won't be that bad on the road again. Uh, So look for that to improve for the for the Cubs as well. That's definitely something to support that argument. Yeah, for sure. And and that's you, you like you said, we're splitting hairs. It's just like it's so close that you. You can lean one way or the other just because of you can you can dissect one thing on this team on each team, and it's going to be so close. Like these teams were right there all year. They're kind of mulling around five hundred for the majority of the year, and then at the end, all these teams started to catch fire. And it, yeah, as you remember, it was such a, it was like a four or five team race there. I look at the run differential for the Cubs too. They were a plus oh wow seven. St. St. Louis was a plus one hundred two as your division winner. So. The run differential was there for them. At home, they were 21 games above 500. So, you know, you put together a 500 road record, and you're right there, and you're in the playoffs, no doubt about it. They were 33 and 48 on the road last year. So that's if that improves and they play the same way, they love playing in Chicago at home, improve the away record, like I said, and they'll be right there with them. And you can say the same thing about the the Reds too. They were 500 at home, and they had a brutal road record. So you, those two teams fixed those things, and they could be, you know, one and two neck and neck all year. So it's going to be very uh, very interesting for sure. And and another thing with the Reds that you know it's it's a lot like other teams. You know, we got to see it first. You know, this team won 75 games total, and you know to have them going from that to winning a division, like I'll admit it myself, it's a little bold. Again, I'm just comparing these categories. It's so close. But now we move on to this NL West. All right, let's just let's just end the conversation here. The Dodgers w- have won the division. Okay, uh, I don't think we really need to dive into that very much. Where it's, where the interesting conversation lies, Arizona and San Diego are really interesting in those second and third place spots. I love Arizona. I think they have a great lineup. I think the rotation could be really good if everything pans out, and their bullpen same thing. And then San Diego, we talked about it. They have that elite bullpen, potentially, if Pomeranz can redo what he did, if that lineup gets two young players, Grissom and Naylor, to really contribute again, and then that rotation's young and developing. We both agree, though, Arizona is definitely ahead of San Diego. San Diego's got to do it first. But, I mean, neck and neck right there between D-backs and pods, would you say? 
Oh yeah, and you know I'll I'll say it now. I think the Padres are right there for the second wild card. I have them right now in the second. I have three teams in the wow. division making the playoffs right now on paper because I think this Padres team team can do it. They are. You always have to have you have to have one one team that you think can come out of the weeds and really just surprise people. And I think this team can do it with the additions they made, the bullpen they have. They're going to shock teams, but you have to do it first. One through eight, two have a great lineup, but are guys like Machado going to do it? Will Myers, Tommy Pham, is he going to translate from Tampa over to San Diego and do it? This team's not as bad as people think. I had an argument with my friends the other night. Oh, Padres aren't that good. They suck. Oh, I know what you're looking at. They're a bunch of, they have a bunch of prospects. Yeah, they have a bunch of prospects, but they are prospects that are big league ready, and they've shown they can do it at the AAA level. That's why I rave so highly of this team. Pitching is there. They can do it. If they put it all together, they can, they can compete with, you know, the second spot in this division. But the, the Diamondbacks, I will give them the edge right now just because they've shown they can win. That lineup is a little bit better than the Padres. Like I said, we'll see it when it, when it comes out in the field. But, you know, I like this Padres team a whole lot, and I think this division is going to be very fun. For sure. I mean, the two names to look at, Trent Grissom, Josh Naylor, and even Frenchie Cordero, if those three pan out, watch out for San Diego. Seriously. I mean, they have, we said it on their pod. I mean, they have the highest ceiling, I think of any team in the NL. Cause if everything goes well, you could, they would be better than Arizona at that point, better than Atlanta. I'd say they're better than the Cubs, even at that point, close to where the Reds are. You're talking, if, if these things really do click for the Padres, they are at that level. Yeah, and then you, you were, how oh, I course, about yeah. Tatis Jr. too. He, he was hurt a little bit in the middle to end stretch of the year, and he had 22 homers, 80, 53 RBIs, and only 84 games played. So give him a whole season, and good Lord, who knows what he could do. And like I said, Trent Grissom coming over from Milwaukee, Josh Naylor. I mean, it's just if things fall into the right pieces, places and just start clicking – and you got Will Myers right now projected to be on the bench. You got you added Yerickson Profar. I mean, you did the right things to propel this team to be in the playoff mix, in the hunt. And you just never know in baseball, you ride a hot streak and you're in. I've seen it plenty of times with the Rays where you think this team's going to be, oh, they're going to be 500. And all of a sudden, like last year, boom, they're in the playoffs winning 90 games. And you're like, where did that come from? It goes with the pitching. Starts with them. Chris Paddock. Zach Davies, Lucchesi, one, two, three. I like that one through three down. Then at four, you have Lamette. So they have everything that they need, the tools to win. You know, you can make some trades middle of the season, depending on where things go. But this team is I, – I can't rave highly enough about them. They're going to be my – Yeah, and then if they need board. rotation help, they've also got Mackenzie Gore, top prospect, not just for their, for their system, but for all of Major League Baseball. Uh, Mackenzie Gore, I think, what is he – He's the number five prospect in Major League Baseball. So he's also on the way, left-handed starter. But, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. And just to give the Dodgers some some publicity here, if, if they even need any, I mean, you can look at their lineup. I'll just briefly go over it here. Uh, you know, Cody Bellinger right there with with uh, with Christian Yelich, 415 Woba, 162, which run, run created plus with 47 bombs, 115 ribbies. Like, it's just video game numbers. It's crazy. And then you look at Justin Turner, Max Muncy, Jock Peterson, Mookie Betts. Those four players might be, you know, right there. They're right there with the Yankees. Uh, they're right there. I, I would honestly say right there only with the Yankees in the number of players uh, with, with Wobas and one, Wages Run Creative Plus that are that high with that level of production as well. It's really either them or the Yankees uh, this year. I would the Dodgers lineup over the Yankees, but – uh, I, I like this Dodgers team. They also compare an AJ Pollock and Chris Taylor to above league average hitters whenever they want. If Gavin Lux, a prospect, it's just, I mean, the rotation solid, their bullpen's great. Um, I love the Dodgers, but now let's get, I don't know if you made your list, Steven, of, of your top 10 national league teams. We'll do our top 10 rankings and then who we think are going to make the playoffs. So I'll just give my 10 while Steven figures his out. So my top 10, I have the Phillies as the 10th best team. The Padres is number nine. I have the Cardinals at eight. Only reason I have the Padres under the Cardinals is, again, 
Let's see the Padres do it first. I, again, like I said, Padres have the highest ceiling in, in the National League. Let's see them do it first. Then I have Cubs at seven, Braves at six, Reds at five, Mets four, Diamondbacks three, Nationals two, Dodgers one. And then for the playoffs, I have the Diamondbacks and Mets as the one and two in the wild card with the Braves missing and the Cubs missing as well. And so those are my top teams in the National League. What about you, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at your top ten right now. And so, I mean, we have oh, the wow, identical okay. one through four right now. Dodgers, D-backs, Mets. Where I have them switched up, I've got – well, the Reds, I assume, I mean, top five there. So, top five's the same. Then I would go Cubs, Padres, Cardinals, Brewers, then Phillies. So, I mean, it's just – you can shuffle it around. These teams are so close. I I just – I'm raving on the Padres. I have them at I, I, the eighth spot. Just because I think they can, they have the highest ceiling out of this whole National League side. So top, I mean, th- these teams are so close. After about five, you can start shuffling and, and for each team to. So where where do you have Atlanta uh, above the Cubs be. or under the Cubs? Atlanta I have them below right. the Cubs just because I, I have them winning the division right now. The Cubs being that. Uh, so I'm guessing side, then your two wild card um, teams are in the playoff. Cu- uh, sorry, Reds and Diamondbacks. Right now, I have the Padres and the D-backs. In oh wow! My wild card. I just in the totality of the season, I like what the Reds are doing. I like the preseason. You know, all the hype for all these teams. But right now, like I said, for the for the playoffs, I got Dodgers being the one seed. Nats in the two seed, Cubs third seed and win, being the winners of the Central. D backs are my first wild card, and my second wild card is um, the Padres. But it's neck and neck with them and the Mets. It's just you can dissect it, like we said, too many different ways. That's just right now preseason rankings. Obviously, we get 20 games in, you'll start getting a good look at what we have. But on paper right now, that's who I think. It's going to take it to October, but, you know, we can differ on that all day. But Well, I've, I've got a different question right for you now. What are the best new uniforms in the NL? I don't know if you've seen them all. There's three teams in the National League with new unis this year. Uh, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, and uh, the last one's and the Padres. They all have new unis. Which ones do you think are the best? I like the Padres and the, and the Brewers did a really nice job. Uh, I would give the edge to the Padres. I just like that. I like the look that they have. It's kind of, it's different. It's not something you've seen in previous years. I like that, that brown, uh, the all brown that they have, the brown tops and gray pants and the pinstripe concept that they have. The home unis are sick. Yeah. The, the white pinstripes with the, with the brown. Hat. It's just, I like the combination. Um, the Brewers to me, it, it kind of, it didn't, it doesn't look the same, but I think the Padres just gives you a different look and it's something different we haven't seen. It kind of throws it back. To I'm going to go slight edge bit. Milwaukee. I like, I like uh, their uniforms. I, I like the simplicity of it. The Brown, it might take me a second, you know, like I just need to see it on the field first before I like it. And then the Pirates, like they kind of just edited the font on their uniforms and then said, we have new uniforms. Cause other than that, there's really not much different with the Pirates. Yeah, when they, when they came out, people were laughing. Like, what did you change? Like, it doesn't like to, it's not like too much of a jump. Like Milwaukee and and, uh, and the Padres went with two different like concepts. Like the Milwaukee, they changed like the the, the design and look of their uh, of their jerseys, and then the hats they went with the with the ball glove on top of it. And the their, their third alternates are are honestly clean, so clean. And I think they did a great job. Branding, marketing, it's becoming – everyone's getting new uniforms every single year, it seems like. I can't keep up. Yeah, I, I know. There's a few really in the nice AL job. off the top of my head. I can only really – I think Texas and maybe Toronto got new uniforms, but we'll talk about those in the AL. But, you know, it's just the, these new Nike uniforms, man. The only thing I don't like about them is putting that Nike logo on the front of the jersey. I Like, what, what do you think about that? Because, like, the Yankee uniform, man, like, it's been the same thing for 100-something years, and now they have to put – a Nike swoosh on it. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I'm not a big fan. I mean, in college, I like it because it's college. You're got, you're trying to you know they're trying to market. You have so many different teams, but I like the clean the clean like you know just old school look. You know, to me, I like it to look you know just original. With it, it kind of it's it's kind of a distraction with the logo, the Nike swoosh on the side. It'll grow on everyone as as it does with everything, but. I just think, like you made the perfect example, the Yankees. It's been the same uniform for for ages now, and to put that in front, it kind of looks a little strange to me. But uh, it's not a huge difference. But I, I don't. I think it should have been on either like the small on the side, like on the arm sleeve or something. But not. Yeah, you know, to me, it's like it's like what the, the fuck, front. Nike? You know, it's like how much exposure do you need? Like if if there's a Nike logo on the sleeve, everyone knows what Nike is. Everyone wears Nike. You know, why do you have to have the logo on the front? Especially considering, I mean, Majestic put theirs yeah. in a tiny little square on your neck, uh, on the back of your neck. So Majestic wasn't trying to yeah. advertise their logo. It's like you could have made it tinier. Yeah, you can go on any website and look at, if you wanted to buy any Major League merch, Majestic owned that whole, they owned the MLB for the longest time until Nike now has the jersey um, ownership. But like, really, you don't have to put your face up. Yeah. We know who Nike is. We don't need to know who you are. You're already endorsed. You're athletes, Tiger Woods. I mean, you go down the list. You're, you're already sponsored. Yeah, enough. please, you man. I mean, just uniforms. take anything but the uniforms. But they have. So we, have, we can't even do anything about it. And we can't even see them be worn right now because no baseball is being played. So the only updates we've heard about that uh, since our last podcast, uh, Dr. Fauci uh, said the other day that, he can see baseball coming back if they do know fans, um, which is great and all, but we talked about it. How, how realistic is that if you're telling players, yeah, we're just going to take you out of your house for four and a half months, isolate you in a hotel room, and then you've got to play by yourself for four months. Like, I don't know how realistic that is, especially considering they're looking at changing the divisions because they're going to have teams play in Florida and Arizona in their spring training leagues. So it's like, what? what is this? Is this even baseball? I mean, if they bring it back, the only thing that they would have to do for me, do not have it be played for a World Series title because to me it's an illegitimate season. I just want to see baseball played. I don't care if it's played for a World Series. I just don't want to see that. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think if they do this season, A, is it is it plausible? And B, should it be played for a World Series? Um, it's a good debate to have. I've had, I've kind of gone back and forth on it. I mean, now we're going on a month yeah. and a half without sports and I'm kind of going crazy over here without watch, but the idea, I think they're just trying to get people off the edge. Um, you know, I look at the realignment of the divisions and it's, you kind of, you kind of like tilt your head a little bit. You're like, eh, do you really want to do this? Is it, does it make sense? I think you can keep the whole AL East intact. You can definitely keep all those teams in the same division because they all play in Florida. So I don't know what they're doing there and mixing and throwing the Yankees in a in a West division or something. Yeah. So, you know, I looked at it and it's just odd. You can keep this. You can keep most of the divisions intact. Obviously, you're gonna have some NL teams over here, some AL over in um, the Cactus League. But I just think it's just not it's not baseball to me because you know not having fan like the fans make the sport. I mean, I was watching a, a game the other day. It was the Rays and the, and the White Sox, and there were a oh, record God. low of attendance, 600 people at the game. And some guy hit a three-run jack on the Rays. I think it was uh, Tommy Pham. And there was no – you all you heard was the, the, the guys in the dugout screaming. And it was like – it was it was eerie. It was just like, yeah, I would love to see sports out in return, but the fans make the, the sport. And it's so energetic when there's people there and – to isolate them, they want them sitting six feet apart. I mean, it's just not going to be the same. They're just trying to make shift an idea to keep people going and look for something to look forward to. I don't think it's, you know, ideal, but it is what it is if it gets going. And your second part of the question, yeah. so should it be played for a World Series, correct? Um, I think if they do, I think you have to play for a championship. Yeah, it won't be like, you know, your normal World Series run, but I think you have to play it for something. You know, you got to get the players that play for something. I mean, would you do? Would you, you do a like different trophy, play, like so, a one-year yeah, no. type of competition? Uh, 
I think you just got to keep it the same. I think you got to you just got to present the World Series trophy. If you keep, here's my thing: if you keep the playoff format the same, yes, you you have to keep the same. You know, you have to have the same end goal. Like so, yeah, the divisions are going to be out of whack and stuff. But if you have a full um, ALDS, ALCS World Series, yes, you can keep the World Series trophy. You can present it to the winning team. But if you start doing this, oh, we're going to have a 30-team f- playoff format, then no. Then you can just make some makeshift trophy up. Don't give me that. I don't want it. If you keep it in, like, the integrity of the of the trophy, we talked about the Stanley Cup, keep it the same. Then, That's yeah, true. Those are fair I'll points. So that will do it here for our National League playoff pod. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, you can listen to the other 15 we've done for each individual team. If you're a fan of any of those teams and you just want to hear a deeper dive, you can go take a listen to those. And we're going to be doing the same thing with the American League starting tomorrow. You'll hear our Seattle Mariners uh, pod that'll start the AL West. Then we'll do AL Central. Then we'll do AL East. Um, and we're actually going to start adding an, a, a way to watch us. So the way we're going to do it, we all got new microphones. Steven, you're getting yours tomorrow. And we'll be able to put some video feeds on our YouTube channel instead of just audio. Um, obviously, you can still keep listening on Apple Podcasts, but... We'll provide that visual feature for you guys uh, starting tomorrow, I guess, with these AL West pods. And uh, for Stephen Cashin, I am Jacob Brown, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.